Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. There we go. Some of you kind of, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Right, there we go. That was, we can kind of, okay, maybe you'll get louder later. Um, if I say something controversial, you can make noise. Uh, hey, good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Travis. I'm the Connections Pastor, and it's such an honor and privilege every time I get to be on this stage in any capacity, uh, just to be able to share a few moments with each and every one of you. I think these moments are much more sacred than sometimes we realize, uh, because like Patrick said, the Creator God wants to speak to everyone in here, and he's making lots of noise <laughs> backstage, <laughs> or that's Saxton, I don't know. Um, I'm concerned. If you're okay, just stay back there. Um, and uh, he was trying to get somebody's attention in the room. Um, but he does want to speak to us. And so I just want to encourage you that whatever you hear, um, allow yourself to just soak it in. Um, I, I, I labored over this message, and I don't mean uh, clap because I put a lot of work in. Um, I, I, this last week, I was just, I was kind of caught up in all that Paul was saying in the few verses I get to talk about. And I was like, man, if, if I have to sit in it, all week, then how do I get them to sit in it for as long as I take? I'm not going to tell you how many minutes because then you're going to look and then we're going to be in a bad place. How, how can I deliver this information with limited time? That's a God thing. He has to speak to you, but you have to be willing to receive it. So will you? Will you receive what he has to say? We've been in this series, Ephesians. I think I'm on, we're on week seven. And a uh, quick breakdown, you'll see up here on the graphic, Ephesians is broken down into two parts. You got the theological side, chapters one through three, and you got the practical side, four through six. Last week, Patrick, pa Pastor Patrick opened up this section of Ephesians, did an incredible job. Thank you so much for that word. And everything he taught on, I'm going to build on top of. So if you didn't watch it, well, you're going to go do that because you're going to be a little bit lost. No, I'm just kidding. I'll make sure I catch you up. Uh, essentially, what he was talking about is this idea that we as a church, as a family, are actually kind of dependent on one another. That, that what you do in the context of this family affects me. And that what I do affects you. And when we can all bring our gifts to the table and use them for the sake of his kingdom, we all benefit. But it's not an optional thing. It's actually necessary for us to do so. He talked about this, uh, this idea that we will never be fully us without the church, and the church will never be fully it without us. And so I just want to encourage you today, no matter where you're at, you're a very integral part of this family. And everything that Paul says in this next chapter, or this next part of this chapter, is building on that idea. He says, actually, at the very beginning, chapter 4, verse 1, he uses this word, therefore. Patrick and I actually geeked out for a few minutes earlier this week, talking about how funny it is that Paul uses this word all the time. You look at his New Testament writings, and it's like, dude, choose a new word. In language arts, they told us we can't use the same word over and over again. And apparently, he didn't learn that from his teacher. Because every intro, he's like, therefore. You're like, I get it. This is like a long run-on sentence that's six chapters long. But why does he do it? Because he's building. He's saying, okay, here's some theology. And that theology affects this theology, which affects this theology. And now you need to go do these things that are built on that theology. What you believe has to impact what you do. So now he's in this place, so chapter 4 opens up, he's like, therefore, partway through this letter, there's some things you got to do now based on what you believe. And then he wraps up in verse 16 saying, as each part does its own special part, he's talking about our gifts, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body can be healthy. Show of hands, who wants a healthy body? Show of hands. Some of you are like, nope. Nope, I'm good right where I'm at. Healthy body. He's not talking about our physical body, while that's a very important conversation for another time. He's talking about the body, the family of believers. He's saying if we want to be healthy, we actually got to do this thing together. There's no I in team is essentially what he's getting to. Now, before I jump into the section I get to talk about, which is Ephesians 4, 17 to 32, for those that are taking notes, I'm going to take a moment and pray. Pray with me. Dear God, thank you for the next few moments that we get to share together. Would you speak? We're fully dependent on your spirit speaking right now. Throw my notes out the window if need be. Throw my thoughts out the window. Just speak to our family that's gathered together in this room. And let us receive whatever it is that you have for us. In your name I pray. Amen. So you'll see up on the screen, we're going to jump into 4, 17 through 19. Now, this whole passage, not this one, but the whole long one, 17 to 32, is broken up into three parts. And the funny thing is he gets started right here in verse 17 with this word now. In the Greek... It's the same word as therefore. 
I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, he used a different word. Then I looked it up, like, no, he didn't, we did. The English translators were like, no, no, we've got to throw something else in there. He uses the same stinking word because what he's saying is building on what he had already said. And in a few minutes, you're going to see the word again. You're going to get tired of this word. You're never going to say it again. But he says, therefore, based on this whole identity of doing this thing together, now I say this. Now there's more information building. He says, I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Pause. There's a comma. That means pause. But we're going to pause longer than it says. Because this phrase, no longer walk, that instruction means that somebody or many people in that church are currently walking the way they used to walk, despite having a new belief system. Don't, don't walk that way anymore. He's like halfway through the letter saying, guys, you're still walking the same walk, but your talk is different. Now, how, how many of us have ever seen a Christian walk different than they talk? Woo! Raise your hand if that's you. Just kidding. <laughs> Nobody wants to openly admit it. But Paul's saying to this previously Gentile audience, they are Gentile Christians for the most part, hey, you're still walking as if nothing happened. And then he explains what that walk looks like. You got futile thinking in your minds. What does that mean? Your thoughts are empty and pointless. There's no direction in the way you think. You're darkened in your understanding. You have clouded judgment. You can't actually see or understand or grab onto the things, the theology, the belief that I talked about in the previous chapters. You're lost because despite receiving Jesus, nothing's changed in your life. He goes on to say, alienated from the life of God. Man, I don't know about you, but I, I see a lot of people inside and outside the church who feel alienated. But if that feeling of alienation is connected to a former way of walking, why are they still feeling that way? We'll get to that. He says there's ignorance that's in them. You have all the information, but the information hasn't clicked because you're ignorant to the application of the information. He's strong words here. I'm just reading his words. I'm not saying anything to you that Paul wouldn't say because he said it already. He said, and this is due to the hardness of heart. What does this hardness of heart mean? It, essentially, it means that their conscience doesn't even work anymore. Right and wrong is not actually accurate in their minds and in their hearts. They do things because they think they're right, but what they think is right is actually wrong. How many of us have been in that situation before? And due to this, they have become callous. That's a rough word. And they've given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. When I hear this and I read this, I think about the, the fact that Paul was writing this while chained up to a Roman soldier under house arrest. And he's writing to them in this state, saying, I'm physically chained to the Roman soldier, but you're spiritually chained to your past. Paul's like, I'm more free than you are, but it doesn't look that way. And I just picture Paul writing this with this Roman soldier next to him, which that must have been weird. Like, was he bouncing ideas off him and being like, it's pretty good, right? Okay. Um, yeah, can you believe this? And the Roman's like, I don't believe this, right? And it's mind-boggling because... Paul is clearly frustrated in his writing. I'm not, don't worry. But I have to wonder if, if Paul were to write a, a letter to the American church, the Colorado Springs church, Timber Creek church, would he say, stop walking the way you used to walk? Or would he say, good job no longer walking that way? That's a question for you to wrestle with, not me. I'm just going to put it out there. Maybe it's a question we're supposed to wrestle with personally. Does my walk look different? than it used to. I, I think the, the thing I found so challenging about this text this week is that these words he uses I think are far too accurate. But not just describing those that are Gentile and those who don't know Jesus, but actually that sometimes these terms can apply to a lot of people that do claim to know him. And I think that that's what Paul's getting at. He's saying there's a problem here and the problem is all these issues should be gone, but they're not. I don't know about you, but maybe you've struggled with an issue that should be gone and it's not. Something you thought that you worked out, something that you thought you got past and just keeps coming back. And it's as if Paul's saying, move on. Walk the walk. Don't just talk the talk. I think that in and of itself 
is enough to challenge us. But the good news for you and for me and for the, the Ephesian church is that he also gives a solution. Somebody can say amen to a solution. So we're going to check it out in 20 to 24 because he continues. And he says, but, which is a great word in the Bible, one T, not two, don't get weird. He says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. He's saying, wait, what you learned is not aligning with how you live. Patrick hit on this last week a little bit. Our lives are not aligning with what we claim to believe. A a lot of the reason that the world is frustrated with the church and Christians is because they hear what we say and they see how we live and they see the disconnect. And Paul is frustrated. He's like, that's not what you learned. And then he goes on to say, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, talking about Jesus, as the truth is in Jesus. is a really wordy wordy way of saying like, um, maybe you didn't. Maybe you haven't heard about him. I'm just going to assume you did. Because maybe there are some people in this house today who are like, actually, I've never heard any of this stuff before. He's addressing those that have and haven't acted on it. The great news is you get to hear about it today. And then you decide how you're going to act in response to that. He goes on to say, and he hits three points here. One is to put off your old self. Two, to be renewed. And three, to put on the new self. This is his solution. It's a three-part solution to the problem he just talked about. Well, what does it mean to put off... The old self. Well, the word self there is soul and body. It's basically there needs to be an old you and a new you, and you can't think and experience Jesus and still be the old you. Change and transformation have to happen. And what you do physically should align with how you think and feel spiritually, emotionally, so on and so forth. And he describes this old self again, saying, that old self, that self belongs to your former manner of life. It's corrupt through deceitful deceitful desires. I know that there are some people in this room today, if they were to share their testimony, they would say, man, if you saw my old self, if you saw the former manner of my life, it was corrupt and full of deceitful desires. But praise God that I'm no longer in that old self. That's what a testimony is. So we sang about a few minutes ago. Man, if you could see where I was to where he's brought me, then you would see God. Because that's the only thing that makes sense. How did I go from the old self that was corrupt to a new self? And he describes this new self down here. He said, this new self is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Man, this self, I walk in right standing with Jesus. Where he goes, I go. What he says, I do. There's a holiness, which means a separation between me and not only what I used to look like, but me and the world. That the things that my flesh desires are no longer the true desires of my heart. I don't give in to those things anymore. But man, if you knew the old me, and why is it, can we just, why do we overly glorify the old us sometimes? Man, back in my day, yeah, you were a fill in the blank. Got to be careful, this is recorded. You weren't kind, you weren't loving, you weren't honest, you didn't have integrity, you weren't faithful. You were a bad boss or a jerk of a business owner. And now you're here and you spend a lot of time here looking there. Sitting with your buddies, talking about, man, back in the day. But, but if we were talking that way, have we ever actually let go of the old self? It kind of sounds like a weird trophy, right? We're sitting in our holy living rooms pointing to the junk we've done in our lives as if we're proud of it, but we're also really glad to be here. We can't have both. We've got to let go of the old self. And that's really hard to do. It's not easy. But then he's in the middle part, he, he talks about this process of being renewed, and the actual language is be being renewed. Keep going. You can't just be like, boop, renewed, all good. No temptations for me. Used to drink, now don't even know what alcohol looks like. It's like, okay, come on. There are struggles that we're going to continue experiencing on this side of eternity, regardless of salvation. Salvation doesn't save us from every aspect of, of human struggle. But sometimes I think that we want it to. I mean, I don't think that's a bad thing to want, right? To never desire bad things again. But Paul, Jesus, many other writers make it clear there's actually a process and that we have to be actively engaged in it. When I was going through, uh, well, in counseling in general, there's this idea of um, kind of retraining your brain. If you're a counselor in the room, uh, you can be at Next Steps and tell me I'm getting this wrong later um, and maybe help everyone correct what I got wrong. Um, but I remember one of my counselors telling me that, especially with addiction, but it's, it's far bigger than that, 
that we have an emotion, and that emotion leads to an action. And the longer we allow this emotion to lead to that a- action, it, it creates a groove in the brain that actually becomes easier over time for us to keep doing. I felt angry and I did this, and man, I didn't like the way I responded. I felt lonely, so I drank, and I, I don't want to feel that way. I was tired, so then I yelled at my kids, and I don't want to feel that way. But then the next day, I do it again, I do it again, and then all of a sudden, our brain is like, oh, you're tired? Solution. And how many of us know we want to break those patterns, but we don't renew the way we think? I'm tired, but i got to do a new thing. I, I'm hungry, I'm, I'm, I'm angry, I'm whatever, and, and hunger can be a real one. That was one that surprised me. My counselor was like, at some point, depending on what you're addicted to or what you're chained to, Every emotion leads to the same destination. And your brain just has this highway to bad decisions. And he actually talks about this in the next passage, but I just want to focus really quickly on the fact that he says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self. If you've ever tried to quit a bad habit, I'm quitting this cold turkey. Good luck. You're a human, probably going to struggle. Some of you have done it. Good for you. Most of us, when we have something that we want to change, there's a, I'm not going to do it anymore. Here's what I'm going to do instead. And then there's that weird ongoing process of choosing that thing. I feel this way. That's easier. That's better. And you can't do that outside of community. Paul is saying that this comes after a healthy body. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? He says that there's a healthy body that we can be a part of, and then we can start to experience this renewing of our mind. Therefore, renew your mind. He doesn't say renew your mind, then get into church. He doesn't say put off the old self, then go to life group. He says get in community, share your gifts, no matter how messed up you might be, get in that community, get healthy, and start this process of working toward a different way of life together. I think in the modern church, we look back and we're like, man, Man, the Ephesian church, they were this perfect group of people and no one had issues. Then why did Paul write the freaking letter? Right? We do this all the time. Well, I'm not not there yet. They were arguably further from where they should have been than we are where we should have been, or should be. And yet we don't think that way. And it's curious. And so I just want this idea in, in your mind, I want you to wrestle with this idea of what are you chained to? What chains are you holding on to? Because Jesus gives us a choice to set aside that old life, but many of us hold on to it tightly. We'll get back to that in just a moment. Because I want to do this passage as much justice in this limited time as possible, I will give you verses 25 to 32, but instead of putting them up, I'm going to break them down into four kind of mini categories. You see, Paul wraps up this whole idea of old self and new self and renewing of our mind. And he goes into four practices that we can roll out. These are examples of things we can do to actually renew our mind and to actually be a new self. This is not exhaustive. This is just four things that were on Paul's heart. The first one is communal living. And he says these two things. Therefore, there's that word again. Yeah, if you write anything today, just write therefore. Like bubble letters or however you take notes. Just write it. He said, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Who's lied to their neighbor? Never mind. Speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We belong to each other in this family. That's kind of a crazy idea, right? Especially in a culture that says, I'm my own person. Then you're alienated from God if we take what Paul said previously. I'm independent. Good for you, struggling on your own. I need others to help me actually do what Paul just said, to renew my mind and to put on a new self. And then he says, be kind to one another. So not only do we have to speak in truth, we also have to be kind. Why is he even saying this? Were there people in the church who weren't doing this? They're sitting there listening to the scrolls read, whispering untruths to one another? Were they jockeying for position and not being kind? Why would he say it unless there was a reason to say it? Number two, he talks about anger. There it is. Be angry and do not sin. Can we be angry and not sin? Yes, you can. Angry is an emotion. Anger is something you feel, but it can turn into 
some actions that hurt people, even if we don't intend it to. And a renewing of my mind says, I might feel the same things, but my new self isn't going to do what my old self did. You see, because when we're, when we're trapped in our emotions and our sensualities, which he said at the very beginning, and how we feel dictates our life, we are weighed down by what we feel instead of what we choose. And a lot of us say, well, I don't have a choice. This is just how life is. Everyone does this. And fill in the blank with all the other things. I can't control. And he's saying here, you can actually. And he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And the fascinating part here is I think a lot of us have said, I can't go to bed angry. No, I don't think that our anger can sit and stew or else it turns into bitterness, which is sin. And it turns into wrath and it turns into clamor and slander, clamor, yelling, shouting, sl- not the way I'm doing it now, that's acceptable. Slander, speaking poorly about people. And then he says, put away all the malice, all of it. Anything in your heart and your mind that causes any level of harm or negativity toward another person or even yourself needs to go. There's no room for that in this family. You know, it's funny, in, in, in my actual family, Brie Austin and I, one thing early on when she was born, I read this somewhere or heard it somewhere. I don't even know if it was good advice, but I took it. Parents are like, yep, been there. I read this thing that said, you should have family rules, not children rules. Which means to say, in this family, we don't do that. Not, you don't do that. Because you have to have a family culture that they grow up in. Not this separate culture just for themselves. Because then when they leave your home, their values were your values, not theirs. This isn't a parenting message, but maybe parents, you need to model what you're asking your children to do instead of just expecting them to do it. And so I read this and I was challenged. And I said, okay, we'll see how this goes. So I remember when she was one years old and she, you know, unrolled the toilet paper. And I'm like, we don't do that in this family. I'm like, she doesn't even understand. And, you know, and, and I don't. I don't unroll the toilet paper, you know. Um, so I was, I was in good standing when I said that. Um, but then she got older. She raised her voice. She screamed. You know how kids do that and that, like, well, I'm not going to say, maybe there's teenagers that still do this. Uh, so, you know, whatever age they are, I said, we don't do that in this family. Four or five, and she goes, but you yelled. I was telling her not to be chained to her emotion while I was wearing it. Myself. Paul's saying here, guys, we've got to get rid of all of it. There's no room in this family for this stuff. He goes on to talk about external influences. He says that we can't give any opportunity to the devil. And this word devil doesn't mean Satan himself. It means all kinds of evil. Man, is there somebody in your life that you keep giving opportunities to, and the only thing that comes out of their mouth is evil or dark or depressing or mean things? Don't give them an opportunity. And then follow it up with that. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. There's a difference between, between being bound and being sealed. Bound means we're in chains and we, we, we're not free. But our, our redemption being sealed means that we've received salvation. And when we don't live in accordance with that, the Holy Spirit is grieving. Man, if, if I want the power of God in my life, how can I grieve that same power? Some of us, I'm guilty of this too. We say, man, I just, I can't hear from God or I can't understand his word. But am I being obedient? Am I actually doing what he asks to do? Or am I just grieving him and hurting that relationship that I have with him? Who am I giving more opportunity to speak to me? Man, was this church in Ephesus listening to the wrong voices, reading, consuming the wrong things, hanging out with the wrong people, it seems like they were. The last one here that he talks about is good work and good words. It says, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. What we do, our actual jobs, should not be just for ourselves. And, and this isn't a conversation about resources, money, all that stuff. This is just saying that whatever you do with your hands, it should be used to share with anyone in need. You should have the ability with your honest work to bless others. And then he goes on to say down here, but also no corrupting talk should come out of your mouths. So if you do good work, but you speak poorly of people, you're not actually walking the walk. 
Walking the walk includes what we say. And he said, the things we say should actually build up others. So the things we do and things we say should build up those around us. Going back to, if we use the gifts we've been given, that's how we become healthy as a family. So if you found yourself doing things that are maybe not fully honest in the business that you own because you're trying to get ahead, you're not doing what he's saying to do here. If you shave hours at work or, you know, you print more paper than you're supposed to, I think that's a weird rule at most places anyways, but, you know, that whole thing. Like, are you being honest in the way you work? And is your work blessing others? Are your words corrupt? There's that word corrupt again. Because if they are, that's your old way of living. It was corrupt, and yet you're still speaking the same way. The words we speak should be building up others. Man, imagine just for a moment. You turn on the news, whatever channel you think is more holy. And some of you are like, there's one that's better. Okay. (laughs) And it said, hey, the Christian church loves this community. Man, that Christian politician followed through on his word to do good. That Christian, fill in the blank, of good things. Man, every time I talk to a Christian, they only have good things to say. They only have things that give me life. Man, I have this Christian friend, and it doesn't matter who they're talking about, what they're talking about, how they vote, what they eat, their words build me up. They don't come into the workplace being like, that's how you vote, huh? That's how you eat, huh? That's how you raise your kids? Okay. And my house is different. Yeah, well, if we act like that, no wonder those people don't want to look like us. Because the way we speak matters. The way we walk matters. Now this whole whole passage is brilliant. I wish I could dive in deeper, but that's the overview. Go read it on your own. I encourage you, just sit in it because there's so much there. And I think most of us would agree that everything Paul said here is pretty brilliant. Like he's a smart guy. He's hitting the root of a lot of these issues that were in that church and that are in the church even to this day. But Paul is not the originator of this information. And he's, just a, he's doing a really good job of expanding on the source material. You see, because Jesus would say, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It sounds kind of similar to get rid of the old self, be renewed, and put on the new self. It's as if Paul was trying to get them to understand something so much, so much deeper than, than maybe he could even fit on this page of his letter. What does it mean to deny yourself? It means that the things that you feel cannot be the dictator of what you do. But unfortunately, so many of us, and I've been careful with this chain because it's loud and heavy. I asked Ian for it this week, and he said, it's kind of heavy. I said, it's not that bad. And then I put it on my shoulders like, this is really heavy. So I had to wait till this moment to put it on, or else I would have been exhausted. It says here, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Before we know Jesus, we're all wearing some form of chains. Sin is something that that we can't get rid of on our own. And and it's the problem, ultimately. And sometimes, unfortunately, in the church, we will point at people's change and say, that's why you don't fit in here. And the, the ironic part here, I think what Paul's getting to is, as the chained one, writing this letter saying, You're all chained in your thinking, in your walking, in the way you live. See, when you become a Christian, Jesus gives you the ability to set the chains down. He gives you that option. But we have many Christians walking around today, and I did this for much of my walk in faith, going, I'm free, let me me worship, and then I'm tired, and life is heavy, and I don't have joy, and I get angry, and my thoughts are corrupt, and I think the wrong things, but I'm free. Well, Travis, you don't, you don't look free. You look tired and exhausted and lacking in joy. Why would I follow this God that binds you in all this weight of rules and things that just weigh you down? You've got to go to church every Sunday. You've got to be in a group. You've got to serve. You've got to give them your money. You've got to do all these things. And religion feels like weight. Paul didn't say any of those things. So why do we? Why did they? Why was Paul so noticeably frustrated in his writing? Because he's like, guys, you were given a gift. 
but you can't receive a new gift if your hands are full. You can't step into a new life if you never step out of the old life. I know this is tough. You know, one of the cool things about being in a family, about being in a church, is that when, when I finally do set down the change, there, there can be this place where I'm, where I'm over here and, and I, make, I have a feeling and, and I start to walk back to my chains because there's a comfort in the chains. There is because it's known. Our addictions are comforting. That drink at the end of the night of a hard day in the office, that stuff that you consume online, the things that you say about people behind you, the way that you build yourself up and put others down, the way that you steal, maybe not literally, but maybe the way you run your business is basically stealing. Because it's comforting, because it's easy, because it's what it's known, because the grooves in our brain have gone that way for so long. And the problem is, we were born with this propensity to sin. But when we're in a family, we start to walk the wrong way. They say, Travis, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're going this way. No, you don't need to pick those up anymore. That's the old you. And if you actually are vulnerable enough with the people in this family, then they'll actually know the difference of the old you and the new you. And they'll be in the process of helping you renew as you help them renew. Man, one of the things that unlocked my faith is when I sat down with the people that I loved, with the people that I served with, with the people that served underneath my leadership many years back, and I just said, Here, here's the actual me. And I'm chained up, and I'm weighed down. And it's crazy, because when I was talking to my counselor about this, he goes, how many people left when you were honest with them? And I'm like, basically nobody. And he goes, I guess it's pretty easy to put your chains down, huh? And I was like, then why do so many of us struggle? He's like, it's fear, it's unknown, it's comfort. And it's not new. The Ephesian church was struggling just like we do today. They weren't sitting in a room like this, but they were sitting in circles with other people. And when it was their time to share in a group, they gave the right answer instead of the real answer. They said, oh yeah, I'm free. No, I'm a Christian. Yep, I got it. But yet they'd go home, weighed down with chains on their shoulders. And, and I think there's three main groups of people. There's those of us who are truly free that we're not chained anymore whatsoever. We know who God is, we know who we are. Our, our, we're growing in our theology. Our life is more and more and more lining up with what we believe and it's a renewing, it's a process. I'm still figuring out who this new me is. I like this me a whole lot better than that me, but I, I gotta keep walking in it. It's not a jacket you can put on, zip up, and you're set. It's something you have to figure out. It's something you have to step into. You know what helps when you're figuring out something new? Is having people alongside the journey who already know how to do it. And the problem is sometimes, church, those of us who get here ridicule those that are still there. Well, have you seen their drinking problem? Slander. You're in the same boat, different problem. You think the chains are gone, but you haven't actually changed enough to drop the chains. But if you are here, man, you can put those down. Jesus already freed you. You don't have to hold on to those anymore. What would that look like in this family? What would it look like if we were to actually encourage freedom, not just from a platform, but in a circle of friends and say, no, 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 this is safe. Whatever comes out of your mouth does not make you any more damned than the next person. Then there's those of us who are on this other side of the spectrum, who are, who are bound in chains, have never become a follower of Jesus, have never surrendered to him, and not only are we chained up, but we're locked up and we have no, no sense of freedom. We don't even know that we can lift our hands. But when Jesus went to the cross, he gave us the ability to be unlocked. The, the actual last verse, and I, it's not going to be up here, Paul says at the very end of all of this, his last little command is forgive yourselves as Christ forgave you. Man, he forgave you, so forgive yourself. And I think the place that non-Christians are in, those who don't believe, those who haven't surrendered, they don't know that they can even open up the chains. If you're in the room today, it's as simple as just surrendering to him and saying, I don't even know what all this means, but unlock the chains. I wanna experience freedom. I wanna step into the life that you have for me. I don't wanna be ignorant anymore. I don't wanna be corrupt. But then I think the majority of us are here in the middle and Jesus has already unlocked it. Our salvation is stamped, but we're walking around with chains around our necks. And Paul says, 
You have to forgive yourselves as Christ forgave you. Why would he say that? At the end of all this instruction, why would he wrap up with that thought? Because I think that's the crux of the whole conversation. Because I think without that peace, we can never realize the rest. You're never going to experience a new you until you forgive the old you. And so there's Christians in the room today, even when you worship, and I watch you week in and week out, it's so hard for you to let go of the pride or the discomfort or the struggle and truly worship someone who set you free. Because it's hard to lift your hands when you're wrapped in chains. It's hard to sing when you don't know the words. But how many of us have sang a song in the car we didn't know until that moment? How many of us have praised a football team that brings no value to our actual life? I'm guilty of that. A couple weeks ago, I watched five days of football straight. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Praise God for days on different days on Sunday. I was so happy. But then thinking back on that, I'm like, how much time did I waste watching grown men run around and hit each other? And it's kind of a weird idea, right? Because I feel a certain way when I watch football. And unfortunately, there's still times where I'm chained to my feelings. Some of you in this room today, some of you need to allow the chains to be unlocked and some of you just need to take them off yourself. Travis, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I'm holding on to. You don't know. If you knew, you wouldn't be saying what you're saying. Man, if if people in my group knew what I was holding on to, they wouldn't even let me back. The person writing all this, Paul, was a murderer of Christians. And he says, drop the chains, church. We don't have time anymore to hold on to what was. There's freedom available for all of us. And man, there's times in my life where people, I remember there was a guy who reached out to me on LinkedIn that I went to high school with a couple years back, which that was just weird, first of all. You guys all know how that goes. He's like, well, what's been new with your life? I'm like, in 14 years, a few things. And I kind of just opened up about my testimony. This is a guy I knew who didn't know Jesus, at least in high school. I was pretty sure I didn't know him then. And we had these long paragraph conversations. I actually, I actually put this kid in the hospital in high school. <laughs> had to get staples in his head because we fought in eighth grade. And he's wanting to hear my story and I could have said, yeah, you know, just working the, you know, the grind, got a kid. And remember the good old time? No, he's like, hey, here's my story. And I told him, he's like, man, it's crazy that all of that has taken place, that God has done all of that. And, it, and it's as if I was saying, look, look, man, the guy you knew isn't me anymore. And sometimes we're actually too ashamed to say that to anybody. Why? We should be saying to everybody, our testimony is look at where my chains are. Look at where my chains are. They're not on my neck anymore. I'm not weighed down by my past. I'm free. And you can be too. The chains that bind us are all too similar. And I just, I can't see all of you because the lights, but I just, if I could look into each one of your eyes, I I would just want to say a chained Christian is saved but not free. And Jesus has called us to so much more than just eternal salvation. He wants us to walk in freedom. And so whatever it is that you're holding today, whatever you did in your marriage, whatever you do in your business, whatever you're addicted to, whatever you just can't seem to let go of, whatever you can't seem to get past, when you can set it down, and you see people worshiping and their hands are raised, it's because there's no chains weighing them down anymore. And it looks weird till you do it and you realize the freedom that comes with this expression of love toward Jesus, who loved you so much that he went to a cross and bared all the chains that we could ever bear. And then he took him to a tomb and he left him there. And he walked out and said, there's no more chains on me, so there shouldn't be any more on you. That's what he's inviting you to today. I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna go into this worship song. And in this song, I wanna encourage you, move. Get out of your seats if you have to. Come up here like it's youth camp, 98 for those of you that were in youth back then, or 2007, or maybe high school students. This year is the first time you went to a camp. 
he is worthy of us raising our hands because he's given us the ability to do so freely. He gives us the ability to access him. So communicate your gratitude and your thankfulness in the way you sing to him. He's worthy. So show him. If you're in the room, I want to encourage everyone to bow your heads. If you're in the room and you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, I think today's the day for you. I think today's the day that you can say the chains are being set down. Right now, you can begin this process of renewing your mind. Right now, you can begin a new way of life that looks different than the old way. It's just a simple conversation between you and Jesus that acknowledges what he's done for you, receives his forgiveness, and then forgive yourself as well. So if that's you today, I encourage you to pray a prayer like this. Dear God, thank you. Thank you that you love me so much that you, that you conquered death, hell, the grave, and every ounce of sin that humanity could ever muster up, that every chain has been broken by you. I'm not worthy of it, Jesus, but, but you still choose me. There's no prerequisites to your kingdom except for believing in you. So I confess right now that you are who you say you are, Jesus. And I need your help along this journey because I don't know what I'm getting myself into, but I want to be free. Maybe there's others in the room that you have already said a prayer similar, but you, you don't feel like the weight of the chains has come off. Confess that to him. God, I'm sorry I've held on to the pain of the past, to the struggle of the past, to the shame of the past. I'm sorry I've held on to it. I want to set it down and I want to walk in freedom the way you've called me to. And for anyone else in any other category, pray along with me before we go into the song. Dear God, thank you that we get to be in a place with family and that you're asking us to build a family full of love and grace and truth, so much so that whatever I bring to the table doesn't exclude me or disqualify me, but that I have a seat in this family. And that my chains look like everyone else's chains, but it's time to put them down. God, I'm putting them down today, and I'm going to praise you as if you've set me free, because you have. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing all that you did for little old me. It's your name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?